We're gonna instead we're gonna watch uh, how the left sees the world. Okay. Look, I I I didn't prepare anything for today, so we're we've got it. We've got to do react content. We gotta do react content because I was sick and I didn't prepare anything today. Why does the left hate Israel? Oh gosh, it's still Dennis Prager. Oh no, oh no, we can't escape. Oh gosh, all right. On the surface, it doesn't make sense. Israel is a liberal democracy. It extends full rights to women, to gays, and to its many Arab citizens. What about to uh, the Palestinians? Like all countries which are made up of flawed human beings, Israel is flawed. But compared to most countries, not to mention its neighbors, it is a civil rights paradise. So why? Wait, what? Uh, uh, I uh, no, 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 it's not. Oh, look, Israel settlement, Israeli settlements remain flagrant violation of international law, UN envoy tells Security Council. Okay, so guys, if you haven't been, uh, if you haven't been paying attention to what is happening with Israel and the West Bank and the Palestinians, um, here, here's like a very quick, very general recap for you. Essentially, when the state of Israel was created, it forced out the Palestinians who already lived in that area. And so initially, it was going to be a, a two-state solution. You would have a, a Palestinian state, and you would have an, an Israeli state. And that, that, would, that would be it. You know, you'd have two, two sovereign nations. However, what ended up happening was that over time, Israel, after it had been, because, you know, when you dislocate uh, hundreds of thousands of people in a specific region and create a new country all of a sudden, tends to piss off a lot of the uh, countries that are around you. And so a lot of nations in the Middle East tried to invade Israel, didn't work out for, for them very well. And what ended up happening was that uh, the... Israeli state managed to kind of encompass the existing uh, Palestinian uh, settlements, uh, areas that would have become a country. Now, uh, what ended up happening here is that because Israel had such hegemonic power over the Palestinian state, they were able to essentially start choking out the uh, Palestinians. Uh, of resources, controlling who could and could not come into the country, um, or, or as yet unrecognized country of Palestine, um, and essentially leaving uh, Palestinians in this state of like being quasi-independent but not officially recognized by the other countries of the world. And so essentially you have now the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and Basically, those two areas have been under provisional control of uh, the a kind of quasi-Palestinian government. The issue is that because over time people became more and more desperate, the remaining existing power structures in the Palestinian community were essentially an organization called Hamas. Now, Hamas uh, is very much... Uh, straddles the line between a terrorist organization, between a government, between a political party, between like a gang. So on it, but it is the only functional power structure within Palestine because Palestinians have been squeezed for decades and decades and decades. And the squeezing has largely been a result of these Israeli settlements. So what essentially happens is that in violation of international law, uh, Israel slowly builds out private uh, like neighborhoods and buildings 
into territory that is recognized internationally as belonging to Palestine or Palestinians. And so what ends up happening is that there is a territory creep over time uh, that uh, makes uh, Palestinian territory in Gaza and the West Bank smaller and smaller and smaller. This is enforced with, uh, you know, uh, an impassable wall to Palestinians. So Palestinians are forced into smaller and smaller communities. Um, and on top of that, like Israel enforces uh, this consolidation using like military force. So they use snipers, they use drone bombings, they use all kinds of things. Um, and so the result is that uh, for decades now, Israel has been violating international law to build these uh, settlements. Uh, and largely they are allowed to do this because the settlements are profitable. Um, and so this, this, is a, this is an ongoing international problem recognized by the UN, uh, but the issue is that because uh, the United States exist as, exists as the backer, so you against the Jews? No, I'm not against the Jews. I love Jews. My issue is with the state of Israel, and the state of Israel does not recognize, d d does not constitute all Jews. There are plenty of Jewish people in the United States who are against the state of Israel as well. And they call it out for its, uh, for its uh, flagrant violations of international law and the, the human rights abuses that it engages in. Uh, so, like, I'm, I'm not even talking about, like, Jewish people. I'm talking about a government. And a government, like Dennis Prager pointed out, has its flaws. It's just painting Israel as a civil rights paradise when it is continually uh, pushing people into hovels and bombing hospitals, killing civilians. Uh, I think this is largely a, a really dishonest way of painting the state of Israel. Um, let's see. Palestinian uh, protest. Let's see. Like, here, here's, a, here's another story. Uh, Palestinians try to peacefully protest against their conditions. Uh, Israel killed 190 of them and injured almost, like, 28,000 more. The issue is that this is not a, like, Jews attacking Palestinians. This is the state of Israel enforcing violent policy. The state of Israel does not speak for all Jews. And uh, kind of describing it like that is very, very weird and troubling to me. Um, also, this is based on UN data. So this isn't like the Palestinians putting out like a press release of like, oh yeah, they killed 190 of us and that didn't actually happen. This is using data from the UN confirmed by the international community. I don't think so. Hitler thought so. Are you wait? Are you saying that? Uh, are you saying that Jews that live in the United States or live in Europe are also from Israel? Do you think that Israel speaks for all Jewish people who live everywhere around the world? Because that's a fucking weird thing to think. Do you think that the United States speaks for like all evangelical Christians? when evangelical Christians exist all around the world in every country? No. Th these, are, these are weird parallels to draw. There are a lot of Jewish people in Israel, but Israel does not speak for all Jewish people. Not all Jewish people don't support the state of Israel and the things that it does to crack down on peaceful protests. This is a, this is a wild thing to think. Um, there is a distinction between a political state and a religious group of people that is diverse and lives all across the world. Not all Nazis were bad. Uh, I disagree. Nazis were bad. Uh, I'll, I'll, t I'll, take, I'll take the bold stance of saying Nazis are bad. Yes. 
Even if they were just following orders, I argue that that's bad. The same way that, like, hey, you know, uh, people who are just following orders to kill peaceful protesters, yeah, they're also bad, yeah. You wouldn't be able to show it on stream, but you should really watch a film called The Gatekeepers, documentary, I think. Every single head of Shin Betts uh, explaining what they did candidly. Oof. That sounds really rough. Anyway, uh, this is something that, like, continues uh, to this day. And it's some and it, like, look, you can criticize the United States government and still be for the American people. I can criticize the Israeli government and still be for the people of Israel. These are not things that contradict each other. Um, but I, I can say that, uh, yeah, it's not a civil rights paradise. So why does the left hate Israel? The reason is that the left, and as I always emphasize, I am talking about the left, not about liberals, is not guided by a moral compass. It is guided by three other compasses, a power compass, a race compass, and a class compass. Let's begin with... This is, uh, this is rapidly becoming a weird analogy. I'm not so sure about that. I've never seen a protest in Israel against uh, against their government crimes. I don't know. I I I've I know that there are uh, groups within Israel that advocate for Palestinian rights, that advocate for uh, you know the the working class in Israel. Uh, I know that these groups exist. I just don't think that they have a ton of political power right now because it's kind of falling to right wing authoritarianism. But um, yeah, I, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that they have these groups there, and I'm not going to condemn all of the people who live in Israel. The same way I'm not going to condemn all the people who live in America, uh, like, for, for not being, like, my type of leftist, you know? The power compass. Instead of evaluating people and nations on the basis of right and wrong or good and evil, the left evaluates them on the basis of weak and strong. If you're weak, you're good. If you're strong, you're bad. Israel is strong, therefore it is bad. America is strong, therefore it is bad. No. The issue is that strong countries tend to engage in uh, foreign colonial action. Colonial action is what's wrong. Being strong in and of itself is not wrong. The Palestinians are regarded as weak, therefore they're good. When you're guided by a moral compass, you don't ask who's strong and who's weak. You ask who's morally right and who's morally wrong. Fifty years ago, Israel was not a big issue for the left. Why? Because it was perceived as weak. Well, because it also wasn't engaging in, like, open, keeping open-air prisons and, like, slowly eroding uh, human rights in Palestine. But after the 1967 Six-Day War, in which Israel achieved a stunning military victory, it all changed. Israel became strong, so Israel became bad. And the Palestinians were weak, so they became good. No. It's not the issue. The issue is that they have slowly been erasing Palestinians and, like, Palestinian territory in violation of international law and like cracking down on peaceful protesters and killing innocent civilians. These are things that are wrong, morally. Morally, those actions are wrong. So no matter how much terror Palestinians engaged in, hijacking airplanes, murdering 11 Israeli athletes and coaches at the 1972 Munich Olympics. Okay, but understand what he's doing here is he's painting all Palestinians with the same brush as terrorists, which is like saying the entire United States, all, all Americans are responsible for uh, funding the, the narcos in uh, Colombia, for uh, funding the uh, massacres that took place in Latin America. You know, like, no. Not all Americans are pro-acts of terror. Not all uh, Palestinians are pro-terrorist attacks. 
we 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 like within the past year we fucking assassinated the military leader of a foreign country are we all culpable for that are all americans pro-terrorism because of that olympics blowing up israelis in pizza parlors and at weddings the left's position never changed palestinians good israel bad Just gonna, just gonna emphasize this as being one protest in which 190 people were killed. Just one. In a year. A year of protest. between uh, March 30th of 2018 and the 21st of March in 2019. Look at that. Denied medical, uh, medical services. Um, yeah. Denied treatment from hospitals within Israel. These are issues, guys, that, uh, like, th that are being caused by Israel's blockade on Palestine. Um, and these are issues that we know about. Like, the, it's very disingenuous for it, us to simplify it down to... Palestinians good, Israel bad, because Israel strong, so that means they're bad, and Palestinians are weak, which means they're good. Like, no, there, there's a lot of complex socioeconomic factors going on here. There's, but the primary thing that's going on is that there is colonialism happening, and that colonialism is slowly pushing these people into the sea. Um, because the Palestinians were weak and Israel was strong. That's one of the three ways the left judges the world. You can test this theory in other ways. Why is the United States bad? Because it's strong. And third world countries that oppose the United States are good. Cuba, for example, has been adored by the left for decades. Never mind that Cuba's Communist Party has ruined Cuba, that Cubans have no civil rights, and Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the world. But also the reason Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the world is because the United States blockaded them for uh, 60 fucking years. Also, um, another contributor to this is that, uh, you know, wait, what was the others? Uh, Cubans do have civil rights and also, uh, let's see. Communist Party has ruined Cuba. Most people in Cuba like Cuba. The Communist Party has ruined Cuba, that Cubans have no civil rights, and Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the world. Since Cuba is weak, to the left, Cuba is good. The same was true with North Vietnam in the 1960s. It was considered weak, so it was good. The U.S. was strong, so it was bad. It didn't matter that America was trying to preserve the freedom of the South Vietnamese exactly as it had preserved the freedom of the South Koreans. The U.S. was strong, so it was bad. If the U.S. was so strong, why did it lose the Vietnamese? Why, why did it lose the war in Vietnam? When Wait, since we lost the war in Vietnam, doesn't that make the United States good and the North Vietnamese bad because they were so strong that they defeated the United States? Damn. Damn. Inadvertently, we became the good guys in our own story. Which brings us back to Israel. The stronger Israel gets as it effectively defends itself, as its economy grows, and as its diplomacy... Uh, curious Kit Kat, I don't know enough the, about the internal politics of Israel to know if any sitting politician voices concern over Palestinians. Uh, I would guess that maybe there's one or two. But, uh... 
right now I, I I feel like they're in the middle of a swing towards hard right authoritarianism. So there's probably not many. Diplomatic position improves the more the left hates it. The second of the left's compasses, the race compass, is another reason the left hates Israel. Just as it substitutes weak and strong for good and evil, the left substitutes non-white and white for good and evil. The left doesn't judge people by their actions, but by their race. That's why, for example, the left- Wait, we just came off of a PragerU video where he was arguing that racial stereotyping is good and that you should do it. What? What? Like, wait, guys, liter literally this is like the second video. Okay, no, it's it's two videos down from the one he released today uh, where he defends racial stereotypes. Look, he even talks about how you're lying to kids about stereotypes when you say that they're bad. Okay, cool. Anyway. Left asserts that a black person cannot be a racist. Only a white person can be a racist. And that provides the second reason Israel is labeled evil. Israelis are considered white and Palestinians are not white. Never mind that more than half of Israel's population is not white. I, I just talked about it in the, pa in the previous video, but again, is the dominant socioeconomic class in Israel is white, not like Middle Eastern or Palestinian. Um, so like, yeah, they're able to enact more racist policies because they're the dominant socioeconomic class. <sighs> the result? The left essentially ignores Palestinian terror and loudly condemns- No, we just don't- we just don't paint all Palestinians with this broad brush. There's a diff- like, there's a- such a big difference between blaming all Palestinians for terror attacks and saying that the state of Israel is conducting uh, acts that violate the human rights of Palestinians. There's such a world of difference between those two things. Israel's responses to terror. Now to the left's third compass, the class compass. This is the third way in which the left replaces traditional Western and Judeo-Christian categories of good and evil. In I mean, Dennis Prager, if we're going to talk about traditional Western and Judeo-Christian categories, you have to recognize that in the in the case of traditional Western values, as a Jewish person, you would have been denied access to like doing everything except banking. Um, or like roaming around as like a peddler who got like the shit beaten out of you. Like that that's like the traditional value of like Western uh civilization for the vast majority of like the last two thousand years. Um and like I I just just throwing that out there. Um that that's that is historically how Jewish people were treated in Europe. And it's a fucking travesty. But ignoring that to say that, like, yeah, there's Ju there's a Judeo-Christian category here. Categories of good and evil. Of good and evil. Understand that you would have been considered evil in a lot of Christian communities throughout the Middle Ages. And thankfully, Jewish people aren't anymore. I'm glad that we've evolved past that. Instead of judging people's actions by the same moral yardstick, that of good and evil... The left judges people's actions based on their economic class. Rich people and rich nations are bad. Poor people and poor nations are good. Oh, fuck. All right, we're gonna we're gonna break this down a little bit. You guys, you guys know like the the famous like hypothetical like would you steal a loaf of bread in order to feed your family? A lot of, most people will answer yes. And that's, that's like the fundamental reason why poor people commit more crime. 
they commit more crime because they're in desperate situations. If you keep pushing people who are already in desperate situations, you're going to get more and more extreme acts uh, against the ruling class, uh, against rich people. So that is why generally people sympathize more with poor people because they understand that there is an almost insurmountable uh, barrier between them and being able to live a good life. So whereas rich people tend to be the ones putting up those barriers to keep out the poor people from living good lives. The speak like cla class influences our actions and to ignore that it doesn't uh, is foolish in the extreme. Again with Karl Marx who divided the world by economic class, not- Also, Karl Marx didn't invent socialism. Socialism predates Karl Marx. Anyone who's telling you that Karl Marx invented it uh, is not accurate and doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. And yeah, again, a lot of actions that people take are dictated more by their economic class than by their individual moral compasses because again if you put people into situations in which they need to steal a lot of them are going to steal in order to make ends meet if you put them in situations in which they have to uh take even more desperate action that's what a lot of people are going to do rather than just accept their fate and die quietly not moral behavior to marx and to marxism good and evil is entirely class-based good is defined as workers evil as owners. And that is the third reason for the left's hatred of Israel and of- Also, Karl Marx didn't make any, like, moral judgments on capitalists. He just said that life would probably be better if we didn't have capitalists and instead had workers collectively own capital. That's it. ...of America. They are both wealthy. As fewer and fewer people perceive the- Wealthy. What does that mean? Like, what, what does it mean for Israel and America to both be wealthy? Because you know what? You can still fucking starve to death in the United States. You can still fucking be homeless in the, in the United States. Are we really that wealthy here? I would argue no. It sucks to starve to death in the United States just as much as it sucks to starve to death anywhere else. As fewer and fewer people perceive the world in terms of good and evil, substituting a power, race, or class compass for a moral compass, you will inevitably get more evil. And okay, but the part of the issue is it's more valuable to be able to understand the world as it re as relates to power, class, and race, because that can indicate where the problems in society are and how you can fix them, as opposed to just saying, that's evil, that's good. Well, how do you fix something that is evil? Well, you make it good. Okay, but what is, how? How, how do you make it good? Whereas if you say, oh, this problem is caused by an underlying class issue, then you can actually take steps to rectify that issue. It's not just inherently A or B. You know, you can, you, can, you can change it. You can take actions to change it. And a lot of people have different uh, values when it comes to what is good, what is bad. You know, uh, Prager here is saying that what is good and what is bad is dictated by Judeo-Christian values. However, there are a lot of people in this world, billions of people, in fact, who don't adhere to Judeo-Christian values. And their societies work just fine, and they also have problems with, uh, like, pointing at things and saying that's good and that's evil and oversimplifying it. So, like, we need to understand this, and we need to understand the underlying issues or we can't fix them. Um, it's like, it's like having a broken car and being like, having having a broken car on one hand having a working car in the other and just saying this car works this car is broken well you need other metrics to figure out why the car is broken and why the car is working like you need to you need to be able to understand more variables this is it i fuck very and more question. hatred of the good beginning with israel and america
and ending with Western civilization. I'm Dennis Prager. Yeah, Lily loves stuff. The history of Judeo-Christian values is a bit complicated because it actually goes back to like World War II to kind of counteract an anti-Semitism. However, in a more modern context, it has been revived to, to basically erase uh, Muslim folk and Buddhists and Hindus from the conversation. How would you change a community of poor people who are murderers, gangsters, and rapists? I would largely, sorry, I'm, I'm hiccuping and burping at the same time. Uh, I would largely institute like a program to invest in those communities, you know, decommodify housing so these people aren't in danger of being uh, homeless on the street, uh, provide them with basic food necessities, uh, provide them with decommodified education so that they can better themselves. Um, because a lot of these people don't just go out, wake up in the morning and go, gee whiz, I'm excited to murder today for my gang, the job that I work at the gang. You know, no, people, people don't do that because their life is going well. Uh, they do it because they're desperate. They do it because the gang is where the money is. And so they work for the gang rather than flipping a burger at McDonald's because you can't make a living flipping a burger at McDonald's. Um, so a lot of the underlying reasons for crime is because people need money and they need support because they're in danger of becoming homeless, they're in danger of starving, they can't pay their medical bills. All of these underlying issues push people to commit crimes either for their own lives or to better the lives of their children, their families, um, things like that. Uh, can you help me deal with a homophobic, schizophrenic, aggressive neighbor who's been threatening my family and I? He's been slashing my tires, falsely accusing me of theft to have an altercation. Will not help, landlord will not help due to this person having a mental illness. I have no, I, I, uh, cake, please. I have no idea. Um, I would go maybe, maybe go in person down to the police station with photographic evidence and be like, Hey, this guy slashed my tires. I have pictures of it. Um, and he's making threats against me and my family. Uh, you know, I, I need some help. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what else you can do in this situation to be a hundred percent honest with you. Um, that sounds really serious. I'm sorry you're in that situation. Um, you may not be able to completely fix that community, but you can for sure, uh, fix the next generation of that community. True. Uh, part of the issue is you just, you need to be able to invest in these communities because if you don't invest in them, like the situation doesn't improve. It just means that the, there, there's ongoing incentive for people to join gangs. Now, I don't necessarily think that there is the same kind of incentive behind rape. I think rape is a different problem that is largely uh, perpetuated by like different ideas that people have about masculinity and also due to the fact that people get worked down to the bone. Um, I think a lot of people get really frustrated and for a lot of people also like it's a power thing. It's establishing their, their power and their agency because they don't feel like they have any power or agency in society. Um, which it, it, it's a whole complicated problem I, that I'm not necessarily qualified to answer when it comes to rape. I can have, I, I can spitball a few f solutions to that, but it's, it's a complicated issue that isn't as simple as investing money in these communities which is, by the way, the solution to 